Hey Hope Oakville, welcome to Church Online. We may not be able to look you in the eye today, but we want to know that you're worshiping with us. So over on our website, we have an online connection card for you to fill out on our homepage. You can fill out your personal information and let us know how we can serve you. We would also love the chance to pray for you this week. Also on our homepage, just click on prayer requests and you'll be able to tell us how we can do that. While we hope that everyone who is new will take the time to fill both of those out, we also hope you'll do it even if you've been with us for a really long time. Especially right now when we can't be physically together, let us know you're here and how we can pray for you. So a few weeks ago, we told you about how all of our groups are moving to meeting online. We may be staying in our homes, but there's no reason you can't be known and loved by your church family. For a lot of us, we have more time on our hands than ever before and very little accountability. I actually saw a post from a pastor this week that said, some will look back on lockdown with a deep sense of regret at having missed a once in a lifetime opportunity to grow closer to God. Won't you take this next step to join with brothers and sisters during this time? You will be encouraged, but you will also encourage others as you walk with them in an online group. We really need each other. So head on over to our website to register and we'll be in touch with you soon. Speaking of using our time at home well, there's a simulcast happening on Friday, April 24th that you can watch right from your home. It's called Secret Church, and it's going to talk about how Christians should relate to governments. Romans 13.1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. But what if you struggle with the decisions of those authorities? How does this command apply to the persecuted? And what do Christians do when they disagree about political positions and cultural concerns? These are all great questions that you'll have a chance to explore during Secret Church. Again, that's happening on Friday, April 24th at 7 p.m. Cost is as low as $12 per person, and you can register at secretchurch.radical.net. If you haven't already, sign up for our e-news to keep up to date. And as always, follow us on social media and our website, hopeoakville.ca. All right, well, hey, church family, we're glad that you are tuning in and joining us wherever you find yourself today. And before we jump into our first song, um, I just wanted to kind of pull out um, one of the lyrics that I think is just such a fitting message. It's a song that you um, no, no doubt heard before. We've sung this song lots of times, but I found myself looking at the words in light of the times that we're in right now. And I'm just like, this is super um, relevant to where we find ourselves. And the lyrics go, all we want and all we need is found in you. And um, that's a really easy song to sing when you're in a time of abundance, when you feel like you have so much. It's easy to say, Lord, all, all I want is found in you. But when you find yourself, when we find ourselves in a time maybe of lack, of hardship, wherever we find ourselves right now wanting so much, I think it's such a good reminder for ourselves just to say, Lord, you are all I want. You are all I need. Psalm 1611, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So Lord, remind me of who you are. Remind me of the fact that in your presence is all that I need. And we invite that into our homes right now. Lord, would you come and meet us where we are at? So we pray these songs together as you join us now. Let's sing.
built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ
right now when everything seems uncertain we cling to the rock the solid rock the only one who is certain and we worship you and we cry out that you are holy and you are worthy to receive our praise and so we worship you and we pray this in your most powerful name amen amen hey hope want to share with you some encouragement of how God is allowing us to seek first his kingdom here and around the world during these very challenging days. Many of you will remember Pastor Henry and his wife Carol who planted Membley Community Chapel in the suburbs of Nairobi, Kenya. Now like us, their church is also closed due to COVID-19, but unlike us, They don't have the mechanisms in place to continue to receive tithes and offerings. Recognizing this and the crisis that's unfolding there, we as a church have been able to respond because of the continued generosity of our family here at Hope. We've been able to financially support them in their time of need. Praise the Lord that he's given us the opportunity to encourage another church during this time. Isn't that great? I would like to bring to you our heartfelt gratitude on behalf of Membley Chapel for the additional strength that you, Hope Family, has sacrificially provided to us in this time. The financial and prayer support that you have recently provided us has come in at such a critical time. Such a critical time. And we are thankful. We praise God for you. We are thankful, we praise God for you. Your generosity will help us not only weather this storm, to not only help us to weather this storm, but it is also going to help us make the most out of this unique opportunity to make solid followers of Jesus Christ. That is what it will do. God bless you. God bless you so, so much. Well, back here at home, so far, we've done two harvest market drives and we've already delivered over 200 bags of groceries to our regular market guests and those affected in our church by COVID-19. Thank you so much for all of your generous donations, your food, your funding, and your generosity is really spurring us on to a brand new opportunity. This week, we are starting a new initiative called Boxes of Hope. We want to help as many people as possible by providing non-perishable food and essential items along with a message of hope only found in Jesus Christ to whomever needs help. We have an ambitious goal of delivering 1,000 boxes of hope over the next four weeks. 
Now, I know you're going to want to be part of that. You're going to want to be involved in this. So you can help by letting us know of someone who needs help. I mean, do you know someone who needs help, even maybe right now? If you do, let us know. You can also help by helping supply food and deliver boxes, and you can help by praying for your neighborhood. What if in the next four weeks, we prayed for every family in every town and every city in our region? I mean, walking is like one of those things that we can still do right now, right? So in the coming week, we're going to have an interactive map online so you can start praying for your street and then expand into the rest of your neighborhood as we together seek the Lord to bring the message of hope to our entire region. So that's the plan, right? 1,000 boxes of hope and a thousands of families prayed for. Let's do this together, church. You can learn and find out more information by checking out our website today and find information there on the Boxes of Hope initiative. I am so, so glad to be part of a church family that continues to remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for our sake, he became poor. And I'm blessed to know that this truth, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, is moving us, even in the midst of difficult times, to give cheerfully and generously to our Lord and Savior. So during this time of our service, we just want to pause and pray for the tithes and offerings that we're about to give. Let's remember these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, and then give as an act of worship. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just pray right now for those who are experiencing loss. So much loss in this world at this time. Loss of loved ones, loss of friends, loss of jobs. I pray for those of us, those who have already experienced loss, those who are afraid or fearful of what might be happening next. And Father, I just pray that the words of Psalm 91 verses 1 through 2 would be true in, in these people's lives. Please, Lord, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, Lord, may that be true. May it also be true that they would be able to say of you, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I place my trust. Oh, Father, please use this time around the world, in our country, in our towns, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, to bring people to the true hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Father, would you please use this time to save souls for your glory and your glory alone. And now, as we give, Father, of what you have given to us, please, Lord, use it for your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, that was encouraging. That song is so fitting for the time that we're in right now. I hope you're blessed by that. Hello, church family. Welcome to Hope Church Online. We are giving hope because we are filled with living hope. Welcome to Hopeville. Praise the Lord. The word encourage. The word encourage is from the old French encourage. It means to make strong. It means to hearten. Um, it's the word that is derived from the prefix n-e-n-n, -E -N, which means to make or to put in. And then combined with the word courage, you have encourage. So therefore, I love this, to encourage is to put courage into someone. Isn't that so great? I mean, we've got to encourage each other a lot. Uh, we are placing courage within someone. It's to inspire someone in spirit. Or here's a good word, hope. It's to place hope within someone as well. That's a great name for a church too, isn't it? And this is exactly what we're seeking to do today as we turn our pages to Acts chapter 16 and beyond. This is our prayer to the Lord, that his church may be encouraged. Um, we want to see God's people uh, made strong in spirit uh, and in hope. Yes, Lord, do that. Um, what a beautiful picture that is to place in courage within one another. God, would you be doing that right now? Um, in these days we find ourselves, and I, I, I am constantly finding myself praying for supernatural leading uh, to encourage people. Um, join me in this prayer. I'm, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would be leading me on a daily basis to encourage people spiritually, to encourage people practically, uh, even to encourage people financially. Uh, God, would you be leading me and my family? And I just, again, I just exhort you, I implore you, seek to be a source of encouragement, to place in courage into at least one person a day. Uh, what a blessing that will be as the whole church decides to do that. And so as we think about this word encourage, I want to go back to our series outline where we began uh, many months ago and who would have guessed that we would have been here. And by the way, TV, I, I've missed you. This is good. This is good to have the TV. Thanks for our team for allowing this to happen. I love you for that. So here is our Acts series outline going way back to September. Remember that time? It's, it seems like a long time ago now. But we started in the church begins Acts 1 and 2, then the church opposed Acts 3, that was November and December, then we had the church supernatural January, February, then we just concluded the church on mission, that was March, again bleeding into April a little bit, and now this was our outline, now we didn't go back and change this, okay, this wasn't like, hey, times are changed, let's go, let's have a series on encouragement, no, no, this was there again six, seven months ago, the church encouraged our plan from the beginning, the next three months, that is where we're going to be in the book of Acts and we're planning on being, isn't God awesome? I mean, if there's a time to have a whole series on encouragement, it's now. And so I'm so thankful for that and I pray you're so thankful for that as well. All in favor of encouragement right now? All in favor? Hey, don't leave me hanging in here. Oh, wait, I'm the only person in here. Hey, at home, don't leave me hanging up here. Let's encourage one another, amen. We're all in favor of some encouragement. Well, here it comes. Encouragement brought to you by the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Now, as we turn to Acts 15, 16 today, it's important to know that the ministry of strengthening and encouragement is so prevalent within Acts, and it's often underappreciated. I mean, the church was being built and people were being evangelized and disciples were being made, but then there was this constant going back and strengthening and encouraging time and time again. Paul doubles back to the churches to strengthen them, comfort them, and encourage them. And why would he do that? Why would he need to strengthen and encourage the church over and over again? Well, here's why, because life is hard, because the enemy is real, because the temptation to give up is powerful. And so therefore, the ministry of encouragement is incredibly vital to the Holy Spirit among his people. So all that to say, coming to a home near you right now, the ministry of encouragement in Jesus' name. Let me just take a moment 
just to pray for us right now. Father, would you supernaturally encourage your church, please, oh God, as you have all the way along in Acts and right now, we need the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. We need the comfort and the strength and the grace of our God. Do that right now in every home, every person watching, every person represented, oh God, I pray you would be encouraging now in this message and in the weeks to come through this segment, this time by your providence and sovereignty in our church. Again, we pray in Jesus' name, if you agree, please say Amen, amen. All right, Bible's open to Acts chapter 15 is where we're going to start. And encouragement today starts in quite an odd place. It actually starts with a serious disagreement. That's right, a serious disagreement. But I found myself strangely encouraged even by this this week. So let's get to point number one. It is this, as we are encouraged today, we receive instruction within disagreement, instruction within disagreement. Acts chapter 15, verse 36 says, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord to see how they are. Why? Because he wanted to encourage and strengthen them. He cared for them so much. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take them, one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. By the way, um, um, you gotta get a Bible open. It's so helpful for you if you will have Bible open right now and following along a lot of verses today. So again, you can pause if you need to. Let's get that done. That'll be so helpful. Again, verse 39. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas are about to start their second missionary journey. And their plan, you can read it right there in verse 36 of chapter 15, their plan is to revisit and encourage the churches. But as they get set to go, all of a sudden, there's this sharp disagreement between them. And when the Bible says here, sharp disagreement, this isn't like a, a casual difference of opinion. This is tense. Like this is impassioned. There would be some definite kind of like, you know, real passionate desires one way against each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sharp disagreement. Now remember this too, Paul and Barnabas, like they're like this. Um, they're tight. They've been on a missionary journey. They, they've seen all things, stonings and trials and, and all these different forms of suffering. I mean, they, they are brothers in the Lord. For, for them to disagree and eventually separate, something big is happening here. So what is happening? Well, Barnabas wants to take John Mark. Now you might remember, we've been students of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 13 though, Paul and Barnabas were with John Mark, but John Mark found the missionary journey too tough. And so John Mark couldn't take it. He returned back from Pamphylia and went back to Jerusalem. And that did not sit well with Paul. In fact, Paul was pretty upset about that. And two years later, Paul is a man, again, on a mission to get her done. Like he's, he's, he's rightly on a mission. Here he is trying to spread the gospel. And so this time to take this guy who deserted them, he's like, no, nah, I, I don't think so. But what's so interesting here is you have Barnabas. Now, Barnabas, did you know this? Barnabas was actually John Mark's cousin. We learned that from Colossians chapter four. So there's a bit of family stuff going on here as well, which can always, you know, blood is thick and all of that. But we also know that Barnabas was called the son of encouragement. Yes, well done at home, well done. The son of encouragement. I mean, Barnabas was a man of compassion and kindness. Uh, Barnabas is exuding Christian love and forgiveness. Barnabas is the man of second chances. In fact, it was Barnabas who was the first one to welcome Paul into the disciples when the rest of the disciples were terrified of Paul because he used to persecute the church. So this is Barnabas. This is the, the heart that he has. 
But then you have Paul. And Paul, on the other hand, he was a man again on a mission. Literally, he was on a mission trip. Like he was on a mission journey here with the gospel. And Paul is a man of uh, prioritizing conviction, strong leadership, um, dependability, and efficiency. And who can blame him? I mean, this is, this is so right. Paul was let down once. Now he needs companions who are qualified who are ready for the task at hand. He can't have guys who are gonna wimp out on him. And by the way, like th there's a reason we do interviews for mission trips, right? You gotta find the right people who are able up to the task and qualified and gifted, have the right temperament, all of that. Well, Paul in one sense, he's done his interview and he's like, ah, that didn't go so great. And so he's like, no, I don't wanna do this right now. So it's fascinating to me that as you look at the personality of Barnabas, or the personality of Paul, many of us right now, we're identifying with one or the other, right? Barnabas, a man of such obvious grace, and Paul, such a man of such obvious conviction and determination. Now, some of you at home right now, you're looking across the room and you're like, yeah, you are definitely a Barnabas. Oh, you're definitely a Paul, you know? And that's all good. We need both personalities in the church desperately and everything in between as well. I'm encouraged by that. I hope you're encouraged by that too. So the question becomes this though, is right now, well, who's right? Who's right? Is it Barnabas or is it Paul? Well, I'm going to take the easy way out and I'm going to say both are right and both are probably wrong in a sense as well. On the one hand, you have Barnabas, grace, kindness, forgiveness. And to that, we're like, yes, 100%, we need that. On the other hand, you have Paul, conviction, determination, qualifications for leadership. We're like, yes, 100%, we need that as well. So then we say, well, why is this story here in the book of Acts? What encouragement can we glean from this? But many of us are already encouraged as we walk through this passage. Praise the Lord for that as well. You know what I love about this, this passage, how this is included right here is it tells us, man, these, these, these guys are normal human beings just like you and I. They have struggles. They even have disagreements. I just, I love it. Aren't you encouraged by that? That it's not all rosy. It wasn't all perfect. As much as God was moving, you have again, the Bible presenting real people, real problems, and with real sinful reactions at times. Here's what I think we learn from this passage here at the last part of Acts chapter 15. First of all, this, um, disagreements will occur within the church. Disagreements are bound to occur. They might occur over doctrinal reasons. They might occur over personalities, as we see a little bit here. They might occur over decisions that are made or not made. Uh, these are all factors here. But secondly, we learn this. Listen, godliness within disagreement is everything. And you can argue both ways in this, but it's a sad story that Paul and Barnabas were separated because they were such good brothers and we know that it ends well, but still to see this, it is sad. But godliness within disagreement, again, is everything. Um, um, church, it is right at times for some people at some circumstances to move on. That's just what God does sometimes for a new journey, maybe a new beginning. But godliness in the midst of that is paramount. It's paramount. Now, don't you dare start reading Acts 15 and some of you who are maybe more prone to quarrel, you're like, yeah, now I can disagree and it's going to be okay. No, no, no. That's not what we're saying at all, okay? Pastor Robbie did not say that. It is not. Quarreling is sinful. Absolutely, okay? This is not an excuse to sin and start being divisive. Not at all. It's understanding, though, that disagreements will take place at times. But notice this as well. Reconciliation is beautiful. It's beautiful. What I love about, as the Bible tells us, Paul later on, as much as he was upset with John Mark, later on, he would have John Mark restored to him. Look at this verse here from 2 Timothy chapter four. Take a look here. This is in Paul's last days, his final letter. He's writing to Timothy. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark. This is John Mark. Get Mark. Bring him with you for he is very useful to me for ministry. Isn't that awesome? That's a sign of reconciliation. Good job, TV. You're doing such a good job today. Thankful for that. So useful, again, to Paul and ministry. At the end of his days, you see the hearts coming together with Barnabas and John Mark and Paul as well. Lastly, let me say this about this observation within this instruction from disagreement. By God's providence, you had one missionary you know, couplet that would actually multiply into two twosomes now. 
You would have Paul and Silas and you would have Barnabas. And again here, Barnabas going with John Mark. And so you have a multiplied sense of mission through this one kind of unfortunate circumstance. And again, you have Paul and Barnabas, stressful times. They're on their second missionary journey, the gospel, and hostile. I mean, it's a very stressful time. Now, let me just pull it back to us a little bit. Here we are in stressful times. We are in times, again, great urgency and, and trying in very unique times. And, and there are many perspectives right now as we look across, many watching right now, many different perspectives, many different emotions, many different reactions We need different people, again, in the church represented, different gifts, different personalities. We need these, but listen, let's not sin in the process and how we treat each other. I would say pray for the conviction of Paul and pray for the character of Barnabas as represented here within this text. Maybe listening right now, there's some tensions in families. Maybe there's some tensions in relationships or friendships or coworkers. Whatever there might be right now, differences in direction or decisions or timing, It's imperative, it's imperative that we operate in godliness and humility. Again, don't lose the conviction, don't lose the character either. Strangely encouraged, loved ones, by the instruction we receive by Paul and Barnabas' disagreement. I'm encouraged and humbled by this, but let's keep moving here as we go through this text. Point number two is this. We must be intentional in our discipleship. So Paul and Silas, they head out on this world-changing journey, and it really is, we'll see that. Look now at chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 5. I'll probably read the first few verses here. Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, meaning an unbeliever. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered for the observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the face and the faith and increasing their numbers again daily. There's much we could say here, but I want to focus on this. I want to focus on the intentionality of Paul's discipleship here. Now consider, if you know your Bible, you know Timothy is prominent within the New Testament. This is where Paul meets Timothy for the first time. Timothy is probably an older teenager. Just for the older teenagers, the teenagers watching right now, I mean, place yourself in the text. This is you. This could be you in modern day right now. You could be the next Timothy. That is awesome. God is clearly at work in Timothy's life. And the Holy Spirit made it so clear and made sure that Paul knew it. I love the bluntness of verse three. See verse three there? Look at verse three. Don't look at me. Look at verse three. That even rhymes. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Now, you got to imagine the implications of that statement. It's not like Paul's heading off to Disneyland for a couple of weeks. Paul's heading off to a world-changing missions trip that's going to involve such incredible trial and difficulty and persecution and life at risk every single day. And he wants to bring this young man with him. I mean, an, an incredibly challenging invitation. I mean, if you're Timothy, man, you better hope that you've been kind of working out a little bit and eating your Wheaties because you're going to be tested and you're going to be challenged. And yet God's hand was upon young Timothy. And God would ensure that Timothy would be discipled and Timothy would be used. I love what this text right here. I love Paul's sensitivity to God's spirit working. Uh, I love his discernment to God's leading. Man, we need that. We need that so much. Um, Notice his intentionality of pouring into others. What do we know who Timothy would become? Well, Timothy, of course, his name is on two letters in the New Testament. We also know that in six letters that Paul writes, Timothy's name is in the introduction of the salutation. We also know that Timothy was heroic in Ephesus during strife with Paul. We also know that Paul, in his last visit to Jerusalem, Timothy was with him. We know that Timothy was in prison with Paul as well. And we know that Paul considered considered Timothy to be a son or a comrade, a son in the gospel. That's everything Timothy would become. And this is their first meeting. That's a massive moment. Massive moment for Paul, for Timothy, for the church, and for us. It really is. 
Here's the question and the encouragement we give today. I want to boil this down. I want to apply it right now. Listen, the intentionality of discipleship for you, for me right now. Who are you intentionally discipling right now in your life? You know, some of you might say, well, we're in the midst of these crazy times. We're locked down, we're shut in, we're all this stuff. It's impossible to disciple. Really, really? I suggest maybe it's the opposite. Instead of being the worst time, this could be the perfect time to use your time to intentionally disciple others in Jesus Christ through the means of technology that we have. We're on our phones all the time. We're texting like mad men and mad women all the time. We're social media like out of our heads, right? Can't we use any of that for the intentional focus and discipleship to see men and women growing up in Jesus Christ? One of the greatest and one of the greatest forms of encouragement ever will often be found in intentional forms of mentoring and discipleship. You know, as a church right now, we're being incredibly intentional of our discipleship and our desired encouragement to our people. We're working very hard with online curriculum, online equipping, and online encouragement. I hope you feel that. Take advantage of that. We're working very hard and prayerful about that as well. But the best move that you could make right now is you personally engaging in a discipleship relationship yourself. Our online groups are growing. Join one today. Our encouragement is increasing overall. Receive it today. There's so many creative ways that we can do this. But once again, listen, listen, once again. If every single Hope Bible Church family member decides to engage in some form of mentoring relationship, again, our entire church changes. We are not the same. It is growing. It is beautiful. It is awesome. It is strengthened. It is encouraged. It is encouraged. You must be in a spot in a relationship right now where you are placing courage into someone, giving hope to someone, receiving encouragement in a relationship. Again, I challenge you. I challenge you right now. Who's the Timothy in your life? Who's the Paul in your life? We gotta have both. We gotta have both. Again, again, I challenge you right now. You, I challenge me all of us to be engaged in intentional discipleship at this time, right now, in this season before us right here. Who are the young Timothys in our midst and how God could use them in the next generation? Wow. Every single one of us, how wonderful that will be. So we see intentionality of discipleship and then point number three, we see this. We must long for supernatural direction. Yes, Lord. Supernatural direction. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Man, it's weird preaching to no one at the same time. I know you're listening. Love you so much. This is so good. All right. I can't wait till we get together again. It's going to be awesome. Man. Lord, Lord, sooner rather than later, please. Sooner rather than later. All right. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. This is such a good text. As they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, Having been, notice this, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Wow. And when they had come up to Mysia and they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Amazing. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia. That was a good call. Concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, we probably don't realize at this point just how world-changing this paragraph was. We'll see that in a little bit. Paul thought he was going to retrace his first missionary steps in his first missionary journey, but no surprise, God had other plans. Isn't that so true in our lives? We often think we're gonna do one thing. I mean, we're living it right now. And God has a completely different set of plans that he unveils to us when we need to know it. 
So what I want us to look right now is I want us to look at two maps um, on the screen for us right here, okay? So I'm hoping that you can see this, but this represents Paul's first and second missionary journeys, okay? And so what he's planning on doing is retracing his steps, but there's a huge difference here. As they tried to go back again where they were, they wanted to go south here, a little bit southeast, back to where they were, but this is where the Holy Spirit says, no, you can't do that. I'm gonna send you west. Then they want to go into Bithynia, uh, Bithynia and the Holy Spirit's like, nope, you're not doing that either. And this is what causes them to take a left turn, a turn west, a turn to Europe, and they end up in Troas, where eventually they will see the call to Macedonia. Again, this is, what just happened right here? This, this left turn west, and then this ongoing turn here, that is literally world changing. There are few events that have changed the world more than this direction by the Holy Spirit right here, given to Paul and Silas as they go for the gospel and they extend themselves to Europe west, and again, to see these regions that are there. I wanna show you one other map again that you see here. This is a map, ESV Study Bible, it's like a walking seminary. This is the growth of Christianity in the first and second century. It's just, it's just awesome. It's just a marvel to me. So the green here is the growth of Christianity in the first century. And then the shaded gray part is the growth of Christianity in the second century. Again, look at how fast, look at how awesome this is. Look at God's plan. He turns them west. Go west, young man, west. And look at approaching again, the gospel in Europe, which we are all products of, so many of us at least, are, are products of this nation certainly is Canada. It's incredible. This all technically began right here in this turn of the Holy Spirit to go again to Europe. It just, I just, God's providence, his sovereignty, it's, it's, just, it's just striking to me. Maybe just take a moment, maybe just, just consider what you're being taught right now and just be encouraged as well. Just think, man, like, yeah, no, forbidden by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus didn't let them go to Macedonia and the implications of the millions and really billions of people impacted by that one move right there. Man, our God is just awesome. It's so fun to think about in many different ways. So these verses are amazing to me because twice it says the Holy Spirit stopped the missionaries in their tracks. Forbidden, would not allow. And then this vision for Macedonia, come here, come here. And loved ones, with that vision again right there, the world would not be the same as we've said. Now, what's remarkable to me as we learn in this text and where we are today, Paul was driven west by unquestionably closed Holy Spirit doors. I mean, could you get a more closed door than the Holy Spirit like, no, nope, not going, no, nope, do not enter. You're not allowed. I mean, that, that's called a closed door. And yet, look what God did with it. Think of, um, think of all the closed doors for us right now. I mean, the fact that I'm preaching in this room right now to no one, that's a closed door in my books, okay? And yet understanding that the Lord can take this closed door and open other doors we never dreamed of, which he is doing right now. Only the Holy Spirit can do that, shutting down one door to explode open another door for the gospel. What a prayer that is for our day. In many ways, we are being shut down right now. But you can't shut down God, ever. In many ways, we're shut down only for the gospel to be exploding forth again in ways that we have not seen. Here's an awesome principle and a quote by G. Campbell Morgan from our text today as well. Again, take a look. Look at this. Understand it. It is better to go to Troas with God. That's where he led them. He said, don't go. Don't go there. Don't go to Bithynia. It's better to go to Troas with God than anywhere else without him. That's good. I agree. Here's the question. What's your Troas right now? Well, for me right now, my Troas is this, preaching to an empty room. But I wanna go with God to this place and trust him than anywhere else without him. What's your Troas? It'd be so represented in so many different things, different places, different situations. Right now at this time, we have to trust the Lord. He has closed one, one door, to open another, again, to open another for his glory. And he will reveal again 
uh, for our understanding in his time. You know, I read an article this past week in Christianity Today, and the title is this, Coronavirus Searches Leads Millions to Hear About Jesus. Because so many people are filled with fear right now across this world, and so many people are panicking. They're searching on the coronavirus is leading millions and millions to hear of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I read in this article too that thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are reportedly receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior within this time that we find ourselves in. And you know, um, at Hope Bible Church, in our very own humble way, we have been reaching more people online than ever before through our online ministry. It's humbling, you know, we're just trying to seek the Lord in his direction, how he might be using this. We also want you to know as elders in this church, as we seek his direction as well, that as a church right now, and again, wanting the Holy Spirit to lead us, that we have uh, currently cut our expenses by 20% as a church and the desire for stewardship and prudence in the midst of uncertain times. We believe again, at least for now, that's what we have to do and we're willing to do more. But for this point, cutting in our expenses by 20%, we think that's right. But listen, this is not to retreat and to bubble. This is actually to equip ourselves to what God's given to us at this point to advance the gospel and to see how he might use that and double down in certain ways to see the power of the gospel going forward. Holy Spirit, lead us, amen, church. Holy Spirit, lead every person watching right now, every person to lead them individually as an encouragement to the church and be directed by the Holy Spirit of God and how they can be used and how they can give and how they are led by the, by the Lord for the gospel and for his glory. Holy Spirit, would you do that? I'm tremendously encouraged that this is our text today. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us in power. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us in clarity. We don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit forbid Paul to go to Asia here in our text. Some commentators believe, though, it probably was through something like difficulty or even sickness that he did not allow them to go where they wanted to go. And God providentially using sickness, imagine that, and using difficulty, imagine that, to open up doors for the gospel and to guide his church, again, according to his will. So here we are, we are stopped in one sense right now in the midst of this worldwide pandemic and yet, and yet prepared and propelled in another. Lead us, Lord, lead us, Lord. And so I want you to make it personal right now, right now for you. Okay, look right here, look right here right now. I want you to make it personal. How is the Holy Spirit leading you right now? For some of you, the Holy Spirit is leading you to encourage with great faith. For some of you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now to give so generously to the kingdom because he's he's really set you apart for a time like this at this moment to do so. For some of you, you're gonna step out in faith and use your giftedness in your neighborhood and and with your neighbors you love and you're gonna love them sacrificially and extravagantly. You're gonna reach out to loved ones and people that you know and you're gonna extend yourselves again by faith and grace on the gospel to be used at this time. He's leading you to do it. You know it, you already know it. And now that I've said it, you're like, oh, I can't believe it. And now you say, I have to obey. The Holy Spirit's confirming that right now for you, right now. This is the time. This is the moment. The one door has been closed. The other door has been opened. He's like, my child, let's, let's get walking through the door that I've, I, I've opened. He said no to hear. He says yes to hear. How is the Holy Spirit specifically leading you? I want to encourage you to just a simple thing that I do every day right now as much as ever. I wake up and I plead with God, please, Lord, may today be a supernatural day of leadership and direction. Lead me, God. Lead me by your Holy Spirit. I read Psalm 25 today. Lead, make us to know your ways, O oh Lord. Lead me in your path. Teach me your truth. Yes, Lord, lead me. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord. Pray that, join me. I'm expecting every day to be a supernatural day led by the spirit of God. Intentional discipleship and supernatural direction. We even learn from something from disagreement. And our last point is this, briefly, powerfully, we must anticipate decisions. Decisions for salvation. Amen. Amen. So look at verse 11. So why did they go to Macedonia? Well, in part, here's, here's why. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, And the following day to Neapolis, 
and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Notice, we remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, I love this, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. So they thought they were going there to pray, which of course they were, but something more was happening. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together and one who heard us. Notice, right? There must have been several, but God had a, had a supernatural appointment with the one Woman right here, one woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, probably a wealthy woman, who was a worshiper of God. So she wasn't a Jew. She was a religious Gentile, but she was not in relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what that phrase means. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me, be faithful to the Lord. Come to my house and stay. And I love this, her heart for hospitality. And she prevailed upon us. Here's the point I want us to see, okay? The Holy Spirit specifically leads them to Macedonia. Why? Well, that the gospel might go to the ends of the earth. Amen. But also supernatural appointments awaited them. Supernatural appointments of salvation, I might add here. Lydia, again, a worshiper of God. She had religion. She did not have relationship with Jesus Christ. She would after meeting Paul. Paul would explain to her that Jesus Christ came and died for her sins. And Jesus Christ, the son of God, he paid for our, our sins on the cross and he was dead, but he rose on the third day. And when he rose, he defeated death. And he would explain to her that Lydia doesn't have to work for her salvation, but if she accepts the free gift of grace in Jesus Christ and she's forgiven of her sins, she will live forever, lasting, have eternal life by the grace and forgiveness all found, all found found in Jesus Christ, the son of God. Paul, share with her the gospel as I just did with you. And the Lord opened her heart. She would never be the same again. She would be saved forever, guaranteed access and entrance into heaven, all by the grace and the love of God that met her at that day as Paul had one door closed for another door open for a supernatural appointment that people might be saved. Yes. Unique days, unique opportunity. Church, so many searching, so many opportunities, praying for supernatural appointments, even within isolation, even with shutdown. God, use us, use us, use the Boxes of Hope campaign we just started this week. Use it, God. Use every person watching right now, a heart, a burden for the lost to pray and to care. You know, Pastor Earl said something to me after this past Easter week in which profound to me, he said to me through a text, he says, you know, it's possible, it's possible that last Easter weekend because of the world crisis, it's possible that more people heard the gospel on that one weekend than ever before in the history of the world. I was like, wow, that's profound. It's possible. And you know what? It's probable. It's probable that last weekend, more people heard the gospel in any one day than in the history of the world, just by nature of technology and the nature of how many people, millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people are stricken with fear and are wondering again what life is really about. God is moving. He has closed so many doors, hasn't he? But he has opened possibly the greatest door and the most important door ever, the door of salvation for the gospel through his church to be faithful to this message at this time. I just want to encourage you one last, one last thing in our church here today as we see the gospel go out again from this humble place in our humble church, right, our ministry. But these are all the countries that are impacted watching again our services from this past week, just the past few days. These are all the, cur all the, all the countries again across this world right now, like, like literally from one end of the earth to the other, our little humble ministries reaching people and where they are and how encouraging is that? And we pray this would multiply. And this is just us. You multiply that by thousands and thousands and thousands of ministries across the world and the gospel zinging all over the place, just zinging all over the place and meeting people where they are. Isn't that encouraging? That is so awesome. And, and I'm so thankful. I want you to be encouraged too. Loved ones, this is a time for us to be encouraged. So Lord, may you use this season of tremendous encouragement. In fact, let me just, let me just pray for you right now where you are. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray you would encourage every person watching right now. 
I pray you would supernaturally be speaking to them, blessing them, changing them, and encouraging them with grace and comfort and love and passion for Jesus Christ. Use this next uh, season in our church to be as profound as ever, filled with as much passion as ever, to be so filled with joy and faith and vision. Lead us, Holy Spirit of God. Lead us, supernatural appointments in love and faith to you. Oh Lord, we love you. We love this church. We love the people of this church. We long to be together, Lord. You have closed that door for now. We pray you would open that door, but for now, Lord, as long as it's closed, may we see the other door so open for the opportunities of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, that was such the right song to end the service with. And just as we do our benediction here, we're so thankful how God is working church and um, Boxes of Hope campaign launches this week. Wednesday night prayer meeting with Pastor Nathan. Tune in for that. Again, the second part of our series. We're thinking of how God is working in our midst. God use us to reach those around us. And um, our benediction today, I love this verse from Acts chapter 9. Verse 31, it says this about the church, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. May it be so, and you are so loved.